Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad that you're with us today to stay curious. Today we're going to talk about a, a shuttle mission that was very important, put the Kibo Laboratory of Japan up. That's STS-124 and talk about some few of those cool astronauts on there. But the big news today is I spent the better part of four hours watching the NASA Committee on Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon, UAPs. That's what we want to call the former UFOs. And it's quite a day to be watching this, and we're going to kind of tell you a little bit about what to expect. Basically, NASA is going to investigate this phenomenon of, uh, un of that is flying objects that we can't explain. Some define the forces of gravity. I'm sure many of you know what we're talking about. One of our more popular programs is with Ken Verderami, a friend of mine that worked out at Area 51, and uh, had, he knows a lot of top secrets and a lot of them about this this area. And we're going to have him back on and talk about this. But I'm going to give you my impression and what was said on this uh, uh, show, or not show, it was a long forum of 16 just top of their field type people from astronomers, oceanographers, physicists, science journalists, and astronaut, uh, and so forth. And uh, so we'll talk about that today. Uh, and uh, uh, let me put, put our images up there. Say hi to Marty. Uh, Marty Winkle, my co-producer there. Uh, Marty, you haven't said too much about UFOs as I've been working on this all day today. But uh, in my opinion, uh, this is off to a very good start. Well, you've got NASA has basically taken over the Department of Defense and uh, FAA, Federal Aviation Association, in being not only the investigator, but the reporting center for this phenomenon. And you're going to see how, in a few minutes, how this is truly looking for a needle in a haystack. And the haystack is all of the aerial phenomenon that we know exists out there in our Earth here. That's why we chose the Earth for our, our background today, is to emphasize this is just not an American problem, it's a global problem. And is it a problem? Well, that's what they discuss. Scientists looking pragmatically at this phenomenon that has been around for more than 70 years. And of course, they didn't address the the Roswell and, and aliens being abducting people and, and things like that. It's all about the scientific investigation with a database that you can accumulate data from multiple sources and analyze what these are. And when they do analyze a few of these, they're surprised at what they turn out to be a natural phenomenon. So uh, in my opinion, it's a, off to a, a very good calculated scientific approach. Uh, the UFO researchers and conspiracy uh, world of, of UFO people are not going to be happy with this because uh, I'll tell you in a little bit that this committee basically discounted their data as not being scientific. And that's how NASA is, folks. You might be building a wonderful rocket in your backyard, but until you prove that it can work like Elon Musk did, NASA's you know not going to help you or, or believe you. And that's just the way... I've learned about these wonderful contractors like my co-producer Marty Winkle here and and other people who worked at NASA and the co and they it, it, you got to show me the proof okay and over and over was quoted on this panel today Carl Sagan the great astronomer who died way too quickly about 20 years ago Carl Sagan used to say as far as UFOs are concerned I'd like to believe him but extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence and marty and i were just listening to the uh the uh med multimedia conversation going on after this with questions from the press and it's emphasized over and over by these these extremely knowledgeable scientists that th there is no conclusive evidence that extraterrestrials are behind this phenomenon uh NASA has their own way of doing things, so let's see where this goes. It's certainly a harmless and a step in the right direction, in my humble opinion. So we'll get back to that in a wonderful shuttle mission here uh, in just a minute. Uh, uh, let's, uh, but first, let's look at, uh, let's talk about beer, Marty. All right. 
And Two Roads Brewing in Connecticut is staging a uh, want are asking artists to show them what taking the road less traveled means. And Connecticut uh, uh, resident and American Space Museum partner Chris Cowley there. He's going to put them to the test. He sent them this picture of Gene Cernan on Apollo 17 on the moon. And let's put Gino on a beer can. And tworoadsbrewingcompany.com slash C-O-N-N-A-R-T-I-S-T-S uh, backwards slash will get you there. Just Google Two Roads uh, uh, Brewing there. Uh, and uh, Chris had to come up with a statement of... Uh, why is his image showing the road less traveled? The ultimate road less traveled. Where will the future take us, Chris Kelly says. Come join in the exploration of the finite possibilities of our universe. Lives intersect. Thoughts diverge. As humankind is poised to return to the moon and beyond, blast off on the ultimate road less traveled. With a Gene O'Beer there, Gene Cernan. So we hope that you win that. I'm voting every day. June 5th is when the voting is over. Uh, there's the competition uh, that you'll see when you go there. Connecticut Artist Art Competition. All right. And uh, there, there, this is in the, that's the part of Connecticut there that is homeland there to Chris Cali. I've actually been to Danbury, coldest lake I've ever been in, Lake Candlewood. Uh, but uh, so we wish you well, luck, Chris. Please vote and vote often. Vote uh, his uh, image of uh, Gino on a beer can there. Oh, I got it right there. Gino on a beer can. Excellent image there by our good friend, Mr. Chris Cowley. And we want to remind everybody that uh, the uh, Craig, uh, Crew Dragon Freedom landed safely last night. I watched the whole thing, Marty. It's quite fascinating to watch this recovery off Panama City Beach in the Gulf of Mexico. We had 17 humans orbiting the Earth 24 hours ago, and now we've got 13, all right? But that 17 broke a long-standing record of 14 that was tied, I think, four or five times since uh, the last shuttle missions in 2011. So uh, we're glad that Peggy Whitson and that crew of Axiom are all back safely and recovering. Uh, and uh, we've got six human beings on the Chinese Tangong Space Station, and we've got seven on the International Space Station now. So, shuttles of May, Marty, end of, end of May, and, and uh, wow, where did May go? One of my favorite months of the year, and uh, I did have a lot of fun in it and, and seemed to have gotten the most out of it. Where's my May stuff here as I'm looking around here? Of course, I got it flipped over here. Uh, Ten shuttles of May, like we've talked about. Uh, uh, three orbiters did all ten. Uh, Challenger and uh, Columbia did not fly in the month of May, oddly. Uh, Sixty-six tickets were punched involving 60 different human beings. Five of them took two trips to space uh, in May. And uh, uh, around the May 23rd last week, we had 39 astronauts on th on six shuttles orbiting the Earth uh, on May 22nd to about uh, May 25th there. So, but we're going to talk about the last shuttle of May, and that is this 124. Uh, you know, I like the uh, the patches. They have a lot of the meaning, uh, uh, particularly to the artist who designed them, which is sometimes the astronaut. Well, here you have a a baseball diamond that depicts the discovery docked at the International Space Station. And this mission was dedicated to delivering and installing the Japanese experiment module, also known as Kibo, which means hope in uh, Japanese. Uh, the significance of the mission and the Japanese contribution to the ISS is recognized by the, the Japanese flag uh, and, and depicted on the module. Uh, the rising sun image. And then you got the sun up in the corner and the rays coming down represent the increased hope that the entire world will benefit from Kibo's research facilities. And they certainly have, that when this is placed in orbit in 2008, so it's been up there 15 years, okay, and it has been one of the busier uh, out there. There's discovery in the VAB looking beautiful. 
the launch on uh, May 31st, 2008. It was an afternoon launch at 5.02 p.m., rush hour for the shuttle. And there's your crew there. Uh, we're going to feature a few of them. On the left there is Greg Chamatoff, and then next to him would be Mike Folsom. And then you've got, um, uh, I'm going to guess that that's uh, uh, Garrett Reisman's uh really short he's on the far that's that's a uh, akeem uh, uh um hashidi is on the far right japanese astronaut we're going to talk about ron garen uh mike fossum's the one there and, and ken ham's the pilot so uh mark kelly was the commander all right mark kelly is on this uh uap committee i'm going to talk about what he had to say here in just a minute but um there is the Kibo module being installed on the space station with the robotic arms. Uh, easy to see, uh, one, close to one of the docking ports. There it is, finished. And later on, they took up that platform. It's the only module on the space station where they can uh, take things outside and bring it inside through an air airport, uh, air duct, or airlock, I mean, there, to take a small... I'm not sure how big that airlock is. I think it's something like a microwave oven size type of area to go in and out so this was really a big deal uh, with a lot of spacewalks and uh, uh, a, a lot of teamwork on this at the space station to get this done 15 years ago as i say there it is there and here's the international space station with the kibo you see kind of highlighted uh, on the center and there's another shot of the launch that really did a lot of damage. This was one of the, the more damaged launches afterwards. Uh, no rhyme or reason why a lot of the tile got ripped out and the bricks thrown off of there uh, from the violence and thrown up next to the, the, the uh, fence there. Uh, the, um, and I, I dare say a few of you space workers might have a brick or two like that in your garage from this day in space history when we launched STS-124 on the 31st of May in 2008. A couple of the astronauts there that uh, wanted to highlight as we're looking at that damage again is uh, Mark Kelly. Okay, Mark Kelly just inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, we enjoyed that weekend, Marty. And uh, actually, I met him at an after party. And his twin brother, Scott, okay, uh, and uh, uh, so Mark went to space on uh, on this mission, all right, and commanded it. Scott Kelly didn't, but Scott's part of this committee who we talked about. And he talked about, uh, there's Senator Mark Kelly now from Arizona, and uh, he wanted to talk about his brother commanding this mission. And Scott Kelly said when he, he talked about uh, the UAPs, and, and things that an astronaut may have saw. He said, I saw many things, and they were all proven to be something in the atmosphere. Atmosphere and reflections make illusions. But he said he once, they thought they saw a UAP, a UFO, uh, on this flight, and it was uh, a hot air balloon, and the hot air balloon was Bart Simpson. I think he said that as an aviator. He was flying around and saw this object, and he got all excited and ended up being Bart Simpson air balloon. Uh, well, uh, he said his brother Mark shared the story that as commander of the STS-124 mission, they had to close the payload bay, payload bay doors of the shuttle to come back home, and you can't have anything interfere. But they kept seeing something in the payload bay, all right? And they thought it was a tool, and maybe it was a bolt. They didn't know what it was, but they couldn't... It was up kind of in the payload bay where the... the, the darkness of space was in the earth's horizon in the background but they couldn't close the doors until they knew what it was so mark took a photo with a telephoto lens they enlarged it and they realized it wasn't a bolt or a tool but it was the international space station 80 miles away just hovering in the right spot to fool them that it was uh, something in the in the payload bay just feet in a few feet in front of them so Scott Kelly says that space is a very challenging environment and that sensors have the same issues as people's eyeballs. In other words, uh, you know, uh, trust none of what you see and, and less of what you hear. And Scott Kelly also mentioned this at the end of this uh, committee today. 
He said, 20 years in NASA, and he said, I've never had a briefing, discussion, official or unofficial, about UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to talk about. It's never been discussed at all, he said, on a professional level uh, as an astronaut. So I believe him, but I find that a little bit, why wouldn't you want to talk about it a little bit? You know, hey, I saw this and it turned out to be this. So, you know, if you see something similar, that could be what it is. But uh, I like the Kelly brothers. They, they, they're they straight shooters and, and obviously some of the... Uh, uh, great astronauts that we've had of our time there. So, uh, another person I wanted to highlight real quickly is uh, Aki Hashadi, 53 years old. Three, he is one of the handful of people, and um, Peggy Whitson just completed doing that. He flew in the shuttle, then he flew in a Russian Soyuz to go up to the space station for an expedition uh, four years later in July 2012, and then uh, nine years later, he took a crew dragon to space, all right? And uh, the Japanese stay out at the uh, Beachside Hotel in Cocoa Beach when they're in town to launch one of their JAXA astronauts. And uh, a woman and a man approached me as I was doing a moon gaze at this hotel that I do once a month. And I was putting my telescope away, and uh, it was about 10 at night, and... Uh, a gentleman came up and another woman and I recognized her and I said I remember you from launching Mr. Hashidi uh, last April and she says yes yes meet Mr. Hashidi and he's standing right beside me came up and looked through my telescope I'm a little tired there after a long night of showing a couple hundred people the moon uh, what, a, what a great guy and uh, I really kind of got uh, uh, out of sorts Marty you know I don't get too uh, verklept or nervous around an astronaut certainly but I, I, I was around him he's really a neat guy and can't wait to see you again Hashidi when we launch the next JAX astronaut in August so I want to tell you a little bit about Karen Nyberg that was on this mission 15 years ago uh, she took pictures of the earth from orbit and then made fabric out of them and she now has a fabric line with Robert Kaufman fabrics now don't make any illusion i know anything about fabrics okay i don't but if this is their 80th anniversary that i pulled off the website and i scanned it there about us and a little bit and this is one of the world premier uh fabric places uh you know manufacturers they make everything uh one of the pioneers of uh uh, uh plastic type thread that we made uh, uh jackets out of and so forth in the 70s and 80s so uh, Karen Nyberg's got a fabric line and took a lot of those pictures that are part of her fabric that you see there uh, above my head on this mission of 124. Well, let's get to the, the show of the day, the UFO, an unidentified anomalous phenomenon, okay? Let's say for a few couple things about it. I'm going to jump around a little bit. This is the first meeting of NASA that created a study team. All right, 16 participants. When they started this panel at 10.30 today, uh, and I forget all the people's names that are on there, and the things I'm gonna quote here were, were from them, but I didn't always note who it was from, uh, and you don't really care who it is, but what they're doing is they're creating a roadmap to use tools of science to evaluate and categorize the nature of unidentified anomalous phenomenon. What does the word anomalous mean to them? It is something that uh, data uh, and the observer do not understand, okay? And this committee made it clear it's not their job to define the nature of the UAPs, but to investigate their, uh, how, their pattern and so forth. Um, so a roadmap is being created by NASA, taking the job away from the Department of Defense and the Federal Aviation Administration. The scientific process to study this matter is what this committee is all about, and their public's right to knowledge. But right up front, several of them said, we know that the panelists have been harassed by conspiracy theater, UFO researchers, these type of people that right out of the box aren't gonna give NASA a chance 
that they can do this unbiased and, and, and openly. When every scientist on this panel, and they're not all scientists, there's a couple journalists on there, astronaut uh, Scott Kelly, uh, they, uh, they emphasize that they want to know what's going on. NASA has nothing to hide, and no one is hiding nothing, that the evidence is not conclusive that we have extraterrestrials among us, all right? Uh, and, you know, I've watched all the shows myself, okay? I, I love the, the guy with the wild hair, Sergio, or Giorgio, on the UFO investigative shows at the History Channel and, and other uh, 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 channels do. Uh, and I have a tremendous library of UFO books. I probably had 50 books on UFOs in my library at one time or another. So yes, I've read all of the the, the seminal encounters and, and 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 so forth. And it does boil down to the fact that out of the 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 hundreds and hundreds of of, of UAPs investigated, there is a select number, like under one percent, or that are unexplained completely and yet this is what this committee's after is to find answers to those because uh, part of it is um, uh, what is going on out there so uh, they talk about the reporting stigma that many scientists consider the UAPs to be a fringe science at best uh, and uh, there's there's but they want to apply a rigorous methodol methodology to unidentified anomalous phenomenon as we search for life in our solar system. And this was a point made over and over, was NASA is the experts at looking for uh, uh, things in the solar system and even in the universe, as we've discovered over 5,000 planets orbiting the closest stars. And every year we're adding 1,000 to that, all right? NASA has sent rovers on Mars. We got two SUV-sized rovers on Mars right now. What's their purpose? To discover life on Mars, to discover conditions that were conducive for life. So that's NASA's task is to explore the solar system and the universe looking for to answer the big question, are we alone? All right. So this is a great step, I think, that NASA wants to take this on. Uh, one part I did, but I, there are a couple things I didn't like about it, uh, but I, I we'll get on that in just a second. But when you look at NASA doing this, Marty, I think you'll agree, uh, having worked as a contractor for NASA, NASA has a strong public trust, all right? And it has international cooperation. Those are two big things it has going for it. And... Uh, they believe that the long-term focus that NASA's had on its on its projects and 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 when when they things are on the drawing board and don't launch, you know, for years later, you know, they prove themselves to keep their focus on their task and what they're assigned to do, and then the interdisciplinary data that NASA can provide the teams. This 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 committee wants oceanographers to work with astronomers. Okay from the ocean to the cosmos, and think about the outside-the-box type of cooperations that might go on. So it's an exciting time. Scientists want surprises, but yet they want to do their analysis without jumping to conclusions. They want their data to bear out their conclusions. So let's look at a couple detailed things that they talked about, Marty. Here's what we're up against. When you're looking at things just in the United States flying around, are they UAPs? What are they? Well, it talks about having 5 uh, million square miles of uh, airspace. Uh, 14,000 air traffic controllers are hired, at nine, and there's 19,600 airports around just America, all right? Now, uh, 5,000 of those are public, and 14,000 are private airports, all right? The drones that we have out there, uh, I, I didn't know this, but the amount of drones are 880,000 registered drones in the U.S., and they think that uh, about 20,000 drones fly every day uh, by business operators, people that are using it to inspect roofs and things like that. Uh, and it's not clear how many private operators a day. There is a 400-foot limit on drones, though, okay? 400 feet, all right? That's, uh, uh, you know, 10 feet per story, so that's a 40-story building. It's still pretty, 
pretty tall up there. But um, so those have to be considered as possible UABs. And here's something I didn't know is that uh, every day in America, 92 weather stations release balloons in the morning and the same 92 weather stations release balloons in the evening. So there's 184 balloons every day, okay, times 365 days a year that help tell us what the weather is going to be like. Those are two-hour flights. They burst, and the payload falls back to Earth on a parachute. You've got Starlink satellites that now number 5,000 that are orbiting uh, the Earth. And uh, uh, they applauded this committee that reporting UAPs by the general public is why we learned about the Chinese balloon surveillance balloons. It was quite a flap uh, a couple months ago. So uh, you've got over 1,600 balloons around the world that are flown every day, every day. Every country's got their own weather uh, systems. And you have 5,000 aviation flights a day uh, around the world. So the challenge is the air traffic and sorting it all out. And that's why they say, it's like a needle in a haystack. Um, well, one of the other things they looked at was the, U, uh, the UAP report. And I'm showing you, they had a few charts. It wasn't a, a heavily uh, a charted uh, program there. But uh, one thing they, they, they kept mentioning is the, uh, the typical UAP characteristics from 1996 uh, to, to 2023, okay, the last 17 years. Uh, has been uh, round, okay. Uh, the size is from 3 feet to 12 feet in diameter. White, silver, translucent are the colors. The altitude is from about 2 miles high to 5 miles high. Uh, we've seen them go stationary to Mach 2. No thermal exhaust has been detected. No, no uh, navigation surfaces and, and so forth are, in, are on any of these UAFs. Uh, and then it's got some uh, the details on the radio frequencies that it comes up to with some of the hot spots around the world. And there are plenty, uh, uh, but they all are also hot spots of high human uh, populations. OK, so uh, and like I said, they kept emphasizing that if NASA has been analyzing data for 60 years, that's coming from the places like the Hubble telescope and, and, and the Voyager spacecraft and so forth. Uh, let, let, let NASA's data uh, bear out what these objects are because, because we want to know. Well, here's some of their recommendations to, uh, uh, to follow. One is um, unclassified crowdsourced data. You need a prescribed format, all right? Images from smartphones is of limited value unless NASA takes the lead in evaluating crowdsourced metadata. Crowdsourced metadata, Marty. Do we even know what that means, you and me, as a baby boomer here? I, I'm, I'm going to pretend I know what that means. Crowdsourcing is when you're taking data out there and let everybody uh, uh, play with it, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, it's a way to uh, get uh, a lot of metadata, like it's talking about, crunched quickly. Uh, they, they want NASA to use uh, large-scale scientific instruments such as uh, radio, radio science, radiological detection, gravimetric, and geomagnetic measurements, all right? Uh, Earth science satellites. All NASA and uh, uh, National, Ocean uh, National Oceanographic Association Earth Research Sensing Satellites should be reviewed uh, and uh, uh, categorized for UAP targets, all right? That was a big thing, is, is they're encouraging the civilian scientists to go harvest the NASA data that is at all their collection sites and see what you can find. And they'll listen to you. Uh, so they're trying to create a scientific architecture so that you know what's outside the box and what fits in to uh, parameters. Parameterization of advanced capabilities not yet engineered, all right? Peer review these is what they want to do. So when you know things are within Earth's technology that we have now, then you could think of, well, is it a secret Chinese aircraft or something? But if you're looking at engineering that is baffling us, 
then they say let's create a review board to even dig further. Uh, they want astronomical and atmospheric data to be categorized in foreign partnerships. So uh, the logical things that NASA does best. After all, NASA discovered Earth's ozone hole, okay, and then we've discovered uh, 5,000 planets orbiting the closest uh, 2,000 stars. This is just a chart that, uh, and I screen grabbed all this stuff this morning and this afternoon, uh, showing you that uh, as far as radar line of sight coverage uh, from the ground up to about 10,000 feet, oh my gosh, nothing can sneak through, all right, particularly the 10,000 foot range. Of course, the greens, the heavily dense populated areas, the blue is less, and the white is no coverage there. And they kept emphasizing that you've got to have the people that are used to looking at phenomena in the air familiarize themselves with things that 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 uh, might be deceptive to them. All right, uh, and that's what that slide shows there. So, um, and uh, the big deal is to calibrate everything now this is what the dod part of the unidentified aerial phenomenon has been is uh is is, is uh, determining if it's a balloon a drone or a projectile all right infrared radiation there in this uh, x box there in the middle uh that would show a signature of a rocket plume that's got a nuclear warhead on it and radar and so forth so uh they want to uh, calibrate the sensors that are used by the DOD, Department of Defense, to keep our country safe and, and, and incorporate that in other things like gravitometers and so forth. All right, so uh, uh, one of the other emphasis is NASA has been very involved in looking for life. There's more coverage of some of the technical things, types of surveillance. The surveillance categories, cooperative surveillance, all right, avionics, that type of thing. And then non-cooperative is uh, uh, might be have weather issues and so forth. Well, here's one thing that they gave as an example. This is a very famous uh, recorded uh, session uh, right there in the very middle. It looks like the Star Wars little uh, winged uh, uh, fighter there. Uh, and uh, so all of this data shows that they know uh, how far away it is from the camera, the aircraft's attitude, time references, target and nautical miles, and so forth. And when you see this video, this thing looks like it's just racing across the ocean. But it's an illusion because what's racing across the ocean is the aircraft that's recording it. And when they did all of your uh, sine, cosine, and trigonometry stuff, the object is moving at a speed of about 40 miles an hour, which is consistent with wind speeds at 13,000 uh, feet that this thing was known to be at. So uh, maybe that is something in the air that's being pushed around by the wind. So, um, uh, but again, just uh, to show you real quickly how they, they they talked about this. And then they, of course, say there are these objects that they showed. This is a, a famous one in the, the Middle East uh, last year that uh, uh, all they can say is it's an object that demonstrated uh, 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 maneuverability. A metallic orb was observed in the region there. As you see, the insets enlarged it, and uh, they don't know what it was. And they all the military stuff going on there, they want to know what can we harvest from that data going on. So... Uh, some just an interest in, like I said, I spent all day watching this today. Don't know if you did too. Uh, here's another UFO or UAP. You slapped me around, Mark. Uh, why are they getting away from the, the UFO? I'll tell you that in here in just a second. Uh, but um, um, this is a, a very often jet fighters have seen this type of object that appears in front of them. And then it disappears, and it can be 10 miles behind them in an instant. All right. And uh, this thing actually, they think, plays games and, and might be able to uh, uh, have some intelligence in it. But they also think it's a drone. All right. So, uh, so getting back to NASA and, and what I learned today, <clears throat> most planetary scientists rationally believe that extraterrestrial civilizations exist 
in, in the universe. They don't think they exist in our solar system, though, uh, or there would be more bio signatures of them. Um, and uh, but why are they getting away? You, uh, unidentified uh, anomalous phenomena is clearly a way to get away from the UFO stigma. All right. Uh, and uh, not that, and I would not say that UFO people are crackpots or anything like that, uh, but there is a stigma associated with unidentified flying objects for the last 60 years. And they want to kind of refresh everything, like we're reimagining everything in our world today, uh, to, to get a fresh start uh, to look at the fact that um, uh, this is real phenomenon, we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, it interferes with military tactics sometimes. It is a threat, uh, a military threat to the security of the United States is really why NASA is getting involved in it. And while the Department of Defense and the Federal Aviation Association look at what's on the Earth, it is NASA's always job to look up what is in space. So uh, the process might be boring from the outside, to the public, but the data has to be calibrated from multiple sources, multiple times, in multiple settings. That's just the way NASA does things. So, and you got to look at the culture of scientists that we're dealing with. Scientists in general are rebellious. They don't want to believe in convention. Okay, uh, they they they're looking to to find out what is not convention. All right, uh, and they insisted in today's. Uh, panel that no way are scientists hiding anything. We would love to announce to the world, some of them said, that uh, there's uh, intelligent uh, signs of intelligent life out there in the, so in the solar system or the universe. Uh, that is the central question that the public gets tied up into, all right? Is there life in the universe? And Marty, I think we took a pretty big step today, a calculated step, to uh, use the science of NASA and, and a committee of 16 outstanding individuals, planetary scientists, journalists, uh, astronaut Scott Kelly, are all going to take this seriously. And, uh, and, and uh, there, this committee was formed in October last year. And this summer, every summer is when, I think around June 1st or July 1st, I forget which is when they want to do, in July is when they want to do a report of what is the state of unidentified anomalous phenomenon. So there you have it, folks. I hope Cynthia Rossi got a little something out of that today. Steve Hammer, thank you for watching. Dave Stangy, Doug Forrest, Chris Callie. Let's put Chris back up there again, all right? We got to put Gino on a beer can. You betcha, buddy. We're going to do our best to do that. O.S. Walker, he wants to help out. So go to this website and vote. Hazel Banks, uh, you'd like to see that on a beer can, I'll bet. Tom Usiak, Joe Francis. Uh, Darby, Phillips Miller. Hey, Darby, hope you saw the Sears flowers blooming last week. There's still a few left. And Bill Whiting up there in Michigan. Bill, we're looking forward to seeing you back here in Titusville soon. So go to that website, vote for that gorgeous picture by our friend Chris Callie there, and put Gene Cernan on a beer can there, as that is, without a doubt, the ultimate uh, road less traveled right there to the moon. So thank you, everybody, for... Uh, Watching today, stay curious, Marty. We got through without any hiccups today, so thumbs up to that. And we will rack it up again for you and do it again tomorrow. So I'm Mark Marquette saying, hope you can make plans to come visit our fabulous museum in downtown Titusville, because I'd love to see you personally and bridge the space between us.